the microphone. Do you hear me better? So welcome to panel number five, When Code Napoleon Traveled, uh, which will examine the influences um, and impact of Code Napoleon and French law to other legal systems. Um, I'm Dr. Marion Feinberg. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Tel Aviv University. Um, we'll, we'll have presentations by each of the panelists. It's working. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for discussions and questions after um, the presentations. Um, the first speaker, Hugo Bevan from the Université de, Université de Rennes 1 from France, um, currently a, postdoc a PhD researcher um, at the university, uh, will speak about um, translate French speech from the legislature of the year three in the Napoleon Nep Napoleon Republic of 1799. Um, his research focuses on the sister republic patriots to see how they use the French legal model. Um, he told me he will focus on public law, French public law and the impact on other systems. He also teaches um, classes of history of legal sources and the history of law after 1789. Thank you, Roya. Thank you, Hugo, for this inspiring uh, first paper um, showing the influence of the French model and for keeping to the time. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, our second speaker, Levy Cooper, um, hailing all the way from Australia. Um, Levy is um, currently a postdoctoral fellow here at Tel Aviv University. Um, his research focuses on the history of Jewish law in the late modern period. Um, and um, his recent work it explores the impact of the surrounding legal culture on the Jewish legal, legal system um, and the interplay between different norm genera generating media, um, particularly the role of Hasidic tales, which he's not going to speak about today. Um, today he's going to speak about the codification turn, Napoleon and Jewish legal writing. And you have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon. In 1809, something happened in the Russian Empire that had not happened for over 200 years. And five years later, it happened again. Codes of Jewish law were published. These codes enjoyed immediate and widespread acceptance, and to this day, they remain staples of Jewish law that are reprinted and studied and cited. What precipitated these codification enterprises? My paper today explores the early 19th century Jewish codes on the backdrop of Enlightenment codification era. It is my contention that Jewish codification should be understood as part of the broader Europe European codification turn with a particular link to Napoleon's legal regime. This contention is rooted in four arguments, of which I will present two today. First, I will argue that the geographic proximity and contemporaneity speak to a codification zeitgeist that the codes of Jewish law were part of. Second, the mobility of codification notions makes it theoretically possible that the ideas penetrated the community of Jewish law jurists. Alas, I will not expand on this point today. Third, the various codification notions, sorry, the various codification enterprises around the globe and including Jewish law all used similar justifications, narratives and rhetoric. This too will not be the focus of my discussion today. Fourth, I will address the matter of concrete links by exploring whether codifiers of Jewish law may have known about Napoleon's code. I begin, however, by presenting the two early 19th century codes of Jewish law. It's beyond the scope today to recount the history of Jewish codification. For now, let me say that the second half of the 16th century was a turning point in codification of Jewish law. Within a span of some 40 years, three writers produced codes. These codes became the standard for Jewish law. Following that wave, 
Subsequent Jewish legal writing favoured other forms, commentaries, responsa, handbooks, digests, and marginal glosses. For 200 years, Jewish ju jurists were simply not interested in codification. The era had ended, or so it seemed. At the beginning of the 19th century, there was a break with Jewish legal uh, writing trends. Two jurists independently penned codes of law. The first, Chaye Adam, meaning the life of man, by Rabbi Avraham Danzig, was published in Vilna in 1809. Six years later, Danzig printed a code on a different area of Jewish law. Contemporaneously, elsewhere in the Russian Empire, another code was produced. This code is commonly known as Shulchan Aruch Harav, meaning the set table of the rabbi, and is the work of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, published posthumously by his sons. There is no evidence to connect the two jurists or even to suggest that they were aware of each other's work. Therefore, it seems that a broader trend was in play that precipitated the simultaneous production of two codes of Jewish law. I suggest that that factor may be the codification movement that was sweeping the world of law. The Age of Enlightenment called for rational, systematically structured, clear and accessible law. This call precipitated a codification turn. From the, from the middle of the 18th century, enlightened European monarchs aspired to grant their subjects codes of law. Thus, in the 1750s, a code of law was acted in Bavaria. In the same period, in Prussia, Frederick the Great waxed on the virtues of codification. During his reign, work began on a code for the Prussian states. His plan for a code was translated into English. Frederick uh, commissioned Samuel Coxe to write the code. Coxe's work was translated into French and from French into English. Alas, this attempt at codification was not promulgated as law. A following Prussian effort was more successful. This code was promulgated by Frederick's nephew and successor, though as a code of law, it has been adjudged a failure. In Austria, the preparation of a code began in 1753. In 1797, Austria legislated a code for the newly acquired Galicia. This experiment was expanded to a code for Austria that went into effect in 1811. Codification was also on the agenda in Russia, which had a long tradition of codification, or uh, more accurately, a long history of codification attempts. Russia's codification history dates back to 1649, and Russian monarchs routinely embarked on codification projects upon ascending the throne. Thus, in 1764, Catherine the Great began working on a statement of principles and detailed guidelines for reforming law in Russia. Two years later, she appointed a codification committee commission that was to be guided by her work entitled Nakaz uh, Instruction. Nakaz was printed in Russian, Latin, German, French and English. Moreover, it was printed in at least 43 editions, and it became well known in Europe. Despite Catherine's plans and the proliferation of Nakaz, the commission did not succeed in producing a code of law, though Catherine's vision became part of a national codification myth in Russia. The European codes and codification ambitions were crowned by Napoleon's 1804 code, this famous and influential code would have lasting worth. It heavily influenced law in French colonies around the globe, across Europe, and beyond. This account of Enlightenment legal writing reflects a codification zeitgeist. The temporal proximity between the codification efforts should be enough 
to pique the interest of legal historians and raise the possibility of an actual link between codification efforts in Jewish law and those in other legal systems. The codification zeitgeist, however, is circumstantial evidence. Temporal juxtaposition, geographic proximity, uh, and even rhetorical semblance and intellectual similarity do not prove a link between the codification enterprises. While evidence that would demonstrate such a link would make my claim incontrovertible, locating such evidence is a problematic task. It's highly unlikely that one of the Jewish codifiers would acknowledge that he had borrowed or been influenced by Enlightenment ideas. Systemically, Jewish law could hardly acknowledge kinship with scientific, secular legal families. With that in mind, my thesis that there's a link between the codes of Jewish law and their contemporaries would be bolstered if we could prove that the codifiers were aware of their European counterparts. The question should be asked about all European codification enterprises, but in the present con context, I'll focus on Napoleon's legal activity. What might the Jewish codifiers have known about Napoleon's code and his legal regime? Danzig and Schneer Zalman both lived in, regi in the re regions of the Russian Empire that were conquered by the French in the 1812 campaign. They were acutely aware of the law that Napoleon brought with him since both codifiers had personal experience with Napoleon's legal regime. On June 24, 1812, Napoleon's army crossed the Niemen River to engage the Russians. The force quickly conquered Lithuania, and with Vilna in French hands, the city became the, army, the, the army's main depot. The occupiers were in desperate need of supplies, and while they hailed themselves as liberators, they plundered the city in a desperate attempt to stave off hunger and exhaustion. Later that year, Napoleon beat a path of retreat via Vilna. Napoleon's campaign ended mid-December. All told, French forces occupied Vilna, Danzig's hometown, for six months. In a succinct biographic passage in the second edition of his code, Danzig reported his interaction with the French troops. Danzig recounted how the French had confiscated the manuscript of the second volume of his code. Danzig went to the French army base to meet the commander and request the return of his manuscript. He was fortunate, as are we, for the manuscript was returned to him. Why did the French troops confiscate Danzig's manuscript? And why did they subsequently return it to him? Danzig gives us no clue. I suggest that the motive was simply plunder. The French Revolution and subsequent Napoleonic Wars involved a concerted effort to bring artwork to Paris. The plunder focused primarily on art, but there were also cases of confiscation of books and manuscripts. Perhaps Danzig's work was requisitioned under the assumption that it was a valuable manuscript. The commander may then have returned the manuscript when he realized that it held no value for the French effort to plunder Europe's treasures. While there's no evidence of Danzig's awareness of French codification, he lived under the French legal regime for six months, and he had personal experience of the impact of that reality. Yet his codification work began before Napoleon crossed the Niemen River. Did Danzig know about the foundational treaties of Napoleon's legal regime? We cannot know for certain. In contrast, there is strong evidence to suggest that Schneer Zalman was aware of Napoleon's legal activity. A letter from Schneer Zalman's son and successor, Dov Baer, recounts the family's travails during Napoleon's advance on Russia. The letter written in 1813, a year after Napoleon's retreat, describes Schneer Zalman's attitude towards the leaders of the two warring countries. Regarding Napoleon, Dovbear placed harsh language 
laden with mystical code words in his father's mouth to indicate that French rule was the epitome of evil. What was the reason for, for Schneezalman's support for Alexander and his opposition to Napoleon? The answer lies in the different legal regimes offered by the two rulers. Using imagery from Jewish mystical tradition, Dovbear reported that his father identified Alexander with the mystical attribute of kindness, while Napoleon was identified with the mystical attribute of judgment. In Jewish mystical thought, kindness and judgment represent cosmic opposites. They compete against each other, with kindness eventually prevailing over judgment. Translating these mystical notions into Schneer's Alman political reality, kindness will beat judgment, Alexander will beat Napoleon. Judgment is not used here as a metaphor for a just legal regime. On the contrary, it represents the unbridled exercise of power with no compassion. Indeed, Napoleon's armies pillaged the lands they conquered. I mentioned the confiscation of cultural treasures, but from the perspective of the masses, the pillage of everyday goods to supply the army was acute. Dovbear's letter mentions violent, merciless killings and Napoleon's haughty attitude born of military success. Napoleon's arrogance in battle was linked to his lack of faith in God. The letter also mentions Napoleon's disparaging attitude towards religion. Legend has it that in 1804, in Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral, Napoleon snatched the crown from the Pope's hands and crowned himself emperor, broadcasting that he was above religious authority and not beholden to the church. The colourful tale is of dubious authenticity, but its thrust is accurate, for Napoleon had no intention of accepting the Pope as his overlord. We do not know whether Schneer Zalman and his son Dovbear were aware of this legendary moment, but Napoleon's attitude to religion was widely known. In contrast to Napoleon, Dovbear trumpeted the faith of Alexander, who credited God for victory over Napoleon. Schneer Zalman believed that the Russian legal system was just. On two occasions, the Russian authorities, in, uh, authorities imprisoned him on trumped-up charges. In both cases, Schneezaman was allowed to present his defence, and both incarcerations ended without any guilty verdict. In a letter to one of his colleagues, Schneezaman praised the Russian legal system for the way it handled this case. In contrast, Schneezaman perceived French rule to be unjust and overbearing. He disdained the French legal regime, and he did everything in his power to foil it. As Napoleon approached his hometown, Schneer Zalman hurriedly packed up his family and fled the approaching army. According to his son, he did not want to live for even one day under Napoleon's legal regime. My presentation today of what might be termed the Jewish codification turn has important implications for legal historians. Jewish law presents itself as a discrete legal system. Yet linking the two early 19th century codes of Jewish law to the contemporary codification discourse and more specifically to Napoleon's legal code belies this narrative. Rather, Jewish law is part of a broader legal, intellectual and cultural history. This suggests that scholars of Jewish law, like myself, would do well to look at the surrounding legal culture when trying to understand developments and trends in Jewish law. By the same token, legal historians who have never considered Jewish law may find exciting parallels in this contemporaneous and geographically neighbouring legal system. Certainly descriptions of legal phenomena and trends will be thicker and the discourse will be richer when the ancient le legal system of Jewish law is part of the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>